Welcome everyone. Uh, today's session is the final session on our preview series as we are doing a planning and a review process for a permanent online program that will be available for strata councils, owners, tenants, <clears throat> investors, property managers. So hope you enjoyed the session. We've probably come to the conclusion as we've got near the end that many of these sessions should actually be split up into two sessions. So we could add a little bit more information, but keep them a little bit shorter so they're quick access for everyone. So we appreciate the feedback everyone has given us to date. So I'm without any other delay, I'm going to launch right in. Um, our webinar sponsor today is um, Power Strata Systems. And it's really appropriate because um, one of the key items we're going to talk about today is documents and how you manage documents. And so Power Strata Systems provide an online strata management program. Um, it's really about record storage and management. So um, if you um, have a chance, please go ahead and check out their website. Um, again, this is a pilot project. So we are developing these into a series of, um, of, webinar, of, of real time webinars. Um, it, none of this is constituted as legal advice, um, but it really is going to be um, instructional for strata councils um, as much as possible with respect to managing your corporation within the requirements of the Act. So today is about record keeping and really what we need to understand about record keeping. First, obvious, what records do we have to retain? how we manage record um, retention. And, and this is really important to protect strata corporations' interests, how we um, maintain them, where we maintain them, how long they have to be kept, who has access to records, and how privacy legislation applies to our records and privacy legislation itself. I've expanded the privacy section just a wee bit um, so we can talk about privacy requirements for strata corporations. So the, the act is pretty clear. Section 35 of the act lists a, a long roster of itemized records and documents of the strata corporation that you have to maintain. This includes the records that the owner developer has to provide under section 20 or 23 of the act um, that are obtained by the strata corporation. And it is the responsibility of the owner developer. And this is not a new provision. This has been historic. So don't think you're older strata corporation was exempt from this. This was an obligation of the owner developer to basically provide you with things like prints, plans, drawings, contracts, um, descriptions of property, components, warranties, all of this type of information. Record keeping is divided into four time periods. So I'm gonna break out section 35 into four time periods. It's the records that must be current. These must always be up to date those that you must retain for two years, those that are retained for a period of six years, and those that you must um, retain perpetually. Current records include items that your owners, tenants, property manager, everyone's going to need access to. And it's gonna be relevant because these are going to form information with respects to transaction and sales. Council members and their contact information, owners um, uh, are entitled to that information an owner's list um, with parking allocations and unit entitlement. Make sure your owner lists are up to date. Some strata corporations are actually having title searches done to verify who the actual owners are with quite a few surprises, which is interesting. A notice of a mortgagee, uh, a bank or financial institution that has granted a mortgage has given you very specific notice that in the event the following types of special levies or financial conditions occur, you're required to contact us and we may act or attend a special general meeting or may, we may respond otherwise. Assignments of tenants. Um, uh, under the Strata Property Act, a landlord may assign their tenants, their voting rights, their council eligibility. Um, those assignments must be current and up-to-date. And then, of course, a current and up-to-date version of the Act, the regulations, your bylaws, and your rules. Interestingly enough, there's not much emphasis on the Act and regulations anymore because they are generally up-to-date and live online at all times for the public to access. 
making your owners aware of that would be a sufficient method of, a, of indicating to them how they could re how they could obtain a current version of the Strata Property Act. Every two years, you have to keep correspondence for a two-year cycle. It's either sent or received by the strata. And this is going to be things like emails, letters, notices, correspondence that relates to bylaw or rule complaint or enforcement, alteration requests, which are also about bylaw um, compliance and bylaw enforcement, accommodation requests, notice of meetings, notices of meetings that are issued, these are all within our two-year cycle. Um, and oftentimes it's really prudent to look at these items closely. You may be in your interest to keep them longer than two years. There's no obligation to destroy them after two years. Six years is where we get into the corporate history of a strata corporation. So minutes of meetings, your council meetings, including hearings. Remember that hearings are a properly constituted council meeting. However, in-camera discussions, which are where no record is taken, does not produce minutes other than identifying there was an in-camera section in the council meetings. Annual general meetings, special general meetings, petition general meetings. And if you have a waiver of notice of meeting, those are generally documents under a two-year cycle, but the minutes that are related to that waiver of notice of meeting, which get produced, are also kept for six years. Records that are kept permanent, I think are also quite significant um, because they will have an impact on your strata corporation for the future. So permanent records, resolutions that address changes in your common property. Um, you've created um, an exclusive assignment for someone. Um, and as we see Bill 22 come more into effect, those exclusive assignments may have longer periods than just two years this may actually be something that you're going to want to retain as perpetual documents. <clears throat> also, the designation of limited common property. We've converted or designated areas outside of the units, such as driveways or backyards, as limited common property to give owners more control, but also more responsibility for maintenance and repair. Any decision of the courts, a tribunal, or arbitration to which the corporation is a party, and this includes legal opinions, these have to be kept perpetually. This is different than a Form B where it's where you're required to disclose a decision of the courts, tribunal, or arbitration to which the strata corporation was named. So basically a decision against the strata corporation. So items that, um, so items, for example, an order for sale proceeding where somebody has not paid a special levy, that's going to be a court um, hearing. It'll be a court decision. The strata corporation is a party. Those decisions must be kept perpetually. Uh, the registered strata plan for your strata corporation and any amendments, and that's going to include items such as a schedule of unit entitlement and a schedule of voting entitlement. Any plans required to obtain building permits, so those would have been plans that were originally issued by the owner developer, um, but also if your strata corporation undertakes any major renovations that require building permits with plans, those are kept perpetually. And also a copy of the disclosure statements um, or amendments of disclosure. They oftentimes don't affect the day-to-day -day business of a strata corporation, and they don't govern the day-to-day -day business of the strata corporation, but what they do impact are things like parking allocations or designations, um, and they may have things such as um, um, a, um, easements or information relating to an airspace parcel um, or information um, that relates to joint use of facilities um, that could be um, in addition to having easements that were filed on the property. Names and addresses of all contractors and suppliers. So this comes down to our warranty information. Everything that was done on your buildings that was new, things that were done on renovation or renewal, so people who provide materials, labor, products to major building components, you must keep that information perpetually. Names and addresses of a project manager, um, this would be a general contractor, obviously under the first part as well, if one was appointed. Names of technical consultants and building envelope specialists. If you've commissioned engineering reports, 
If you've had a building envelope consultant look at your building system, you may have issues dealing with your electrical, mechanical. We will certainly have electrical planning reports. We will certainly have items such as sanitation reports that are coming up, uh, environmental reports that relate to um, land use drainage and those types of items. Those are also documents that must be kept. And then, of course, the any document that shows the location of pipes, wires, ducts, or cables, which falls under definition one of common property, if they vary from what is shown on the plans for the building permit. So generally, your plans for the building permit are available through the municipalities if the owner developer hasn't provided them. Not in all municipalities have been stellar in maintaining historic documents, so they may not exist for your specific strata in your region anymore. Um, but that's a place to start when you're looking for them. And the disclosure statement is something that is available through the superintendent of real estate at BC Financial Services, and it is available to every strata corporation as well. You have to keep any depreciation reports that were commissioned and issued to the owners. You have to maintain engineering reports that relate to structure, condition, environmental um, situations, sanitary situations. The insurance policy of the corporation and summary documents have to be maintained as well. We have a 15 year limitation period on things such as liability and losses. At some point, those may be um, triggered and they may have an impact or an effect for your strata corporation. And then of course, coming soon, electrical planning reports which are going to basically evaluate the capacity of energy in your building systems. Pay attention, um, come January, February, March, you're going to learn quite a lot about those. So who's entitled to the documents? Well, section 36 is pretty straightforward. Any owner tenant assigned to landlord's rights or a person who is authorized by the owner or authorized tenant. So this is oftentimes somebody such as a real estate agent, could be the lawyer on behalf of these individuals. They may be accessing or requesting these records if they've been authorized. Um, they must be provided within two weeks of a request. Uh, now, this is different than a Form B or a Form F with respects to information. Um, the information contained within a Form B is not the same as the list of records under Section 35 of the Act. If there, with, if there is a request for a copy of the bylaws and the rules of the corporation, your strata must provide that copy within one week. But generically, records and documents under Section 35 must be provided within two weeks of a request. You can charge, which is set out in the regulations. Um, the fee is 25 cents per page per copy of information if you have to provide copies. And the documents may be held until the amount is paid. So, you know, as you go through this cycle, um, these are the, the, the sense of the records um, that are necessary to keep. Um, also, don't forget that the records that have to be kept on a six-year cycle are all of your financial records. Um, this is for taxation reasons, um, as well as reporting to your owners. And this will include all deposits, all bank transactions, um, bank reports, all of these types of items. So why is record keeping so important? Well, it does provide a corporate history of our property operations and activities. Um, we need to have records to provide evidence of tracking of warranties um, for new corporations and for older corporations who have renewal of components. Um, you know, three or four times a year, every year, we are assisting a new strata council who've discovered a problem with a roofing system or a boiler or something that was replaced within the last five years to discover they ordered services, they got emergency services in to do the repairs, and then they find out after the fact this was actually under warranty. And this is often a record keeping problem. Um, a, a summary of warranties that are available a summary of the periods they run, how to report, who is actually the holder of the warranties is an excellent document to create, um, to be able to sustain. Evidence to me of activity to maintain, inspect and repair components for warranty validation is a huge part of this. Um, under, the, um, under the Homeowner Protection Act with respect to new home warranties, a strata corporation has two years, five years, 10 years, and it's really 18 months, five years, 10 years, but all components for the first 18 months, um, for the first five years, the building envelope, and then of course, for 10 years, the structure, 
Part of that is a contract between the parties. The Strata Corporation has a duty to maintain, inspect, um, and report when there is a potential warranty claim that occurs. And that report goes to the warranty provider. It may include a notice to the developer, um, but if you look closely at the contract, it's only a warranty claim if it's reported to the warranty provider and you will want to have um, some evidence that your strata corporation has been maintaining and inspecting these components. These, this is often a line item in your annual budget for the first five or 10 years, um, annual warranty inspections and reporting. It's a way of ensuring your strata corporation meets its side of the warranty process, which is a contract. Uh, records are also important when you're dealing with evidence in court or the tribunal or arbitration. So whether it's the Human Rights Tribunal, the Civil Resolution Tribunal, an arbitrator, um, small claims court, Supreme Court, whatever it may be, your evidence and records will be essential to be able to defend your strata corporation. And then of course, the final part through all of records is your financial activities, um, how you've managed funds. And if there's any questions of um, loss of funds in some fashion, the strata corporation is in a position to, to protect itself. Electronic records are the most ideal, um, especially if they're owned and maintained by the strata corporation. They provide a collective access, uh, location for access. They are filed collectively by the corporation or the property manager. And we do have frequent changes in management uh, and, and in strata councils. So the ownership of these records isn't lost when there's a change or a transition. I think the days of us having to filing cabinets stacked in a common room or in a storage locker for strata records are probably over. You know, we're really at the point now that we should be scanning records, we should be scanning our prints, plans, and drawings. You can certainly keep them um, for backup purposes, but but for the purpose of protection and ensuring um, that everybody has access to these records, um, a website for the Strata Corporation is an ideal solution. If the Strata Corporation hosts its own website, remember that it is a, a website owned by the Strata Corporation. If you are setting up a website with a service provider, then it is also a website in the name of the Strata Corporation. So who any of the success of managers or Strata Council, council members may be, um, this ensures a continuity of records and that you're not losing um, records and documents. Personal Information Protection Act. So I'm gonna go through this um, and then we'll it, we'll open up for questions because I, I think Daryl's probably going to be surfing through and looking at some of the questions that are coming up. Uh, so here's a, in a in a nutshell what the Personal Information Protection Act is, and everybody refers it to PIPA and PI as personal information. So it governs the collection, use, and disclosure of personal information by organizations. In this case, a Strata Corporation. So it does apply in a manner that recognizes both the rights of individuals to protect their personal information and the need for organizations to collect, use, or disclose information. So this is personal information. It also may be for purposes that are reasonable would be considered under the appropriate circumstances. There are times personal information may have to be disclosed to be able to proceed with the enforcement requirements strata corporations have under the act. Personal information is of owners, tenants, occupants, their names, addresses, and phone numbers. If they are paying for strata fees or levies or user fees, their banking or credit card information, emergency contact information, if it is provided, names of occupants in a strata lot, if they are all provided, debts owed to the strata corporation by an owner, and then, of course, vehicle license plate numbers and insurance. So, you know, we often see bylaws that demand that the um, that owners must display their insurance on their vehicles if they're going to be away for the winter. That's actually personal information. The obligation of the owner is to verify that the vehicle is insured, nothing more, if that's one of the requirements of the bylaws. Owners and tenants have rights over their personal information. So I have rights over my personal information. We have to know what the purpose of collection or disclosure of my personal information is going to be. 
The council just can't randomly collect information without telling me what they're going to do with it. The purposes need to be reasonable. They need to be appropriate. We need to know who's responsible for protecting the personal information. Um, we, we do have an expectation as owners of appropriate um, protection measures. Um, accuracy and, and completeness are protective covenants that we, we are entitled to. Um, we request, we have the right to request access to um, our personal information and we may correct any errors in our personal information. Um, and we have the right to have our complaints addressed over how our personal information is handled. And that could happen either at a hearing with the Strata Corporation, could happen as a complaint with the Civil Resolution Tribunal, or it could happen as a complaint with the Privacy Commissioner's Office. Our Strata Corporation's obligations are around designating a privacy officer to be accountable for the personal information compliance. This is generally a council member or a property manager. It needs to be someone with continuity and authority. Um, and here we're, here's where we get into some language issues between um, the Personal Information Protection Act and the um, Strata Property Act. The Personal Information Protection Act requires a strata corporation to create a privacy policy. However, the Strata Property Act makes no provision for policies created by strata councils or corporations. So how we get around this? A policy that is created becomes adopted through a bylaw. And this way here we end up notifying all owners, all tenants, occupants, what the policy is, how it's managed, um, and who is going to be responsible for it. The privacy officer may change year after year, um, and that may be one of the provisions of the privacy of the privacy policy itself. We need to obtain consent from owners before collecting, using, or disclosing their personal information. And in, and in some cases, that's automatically implied. For example, um, five people um, who show up at the annual general meeting they are not representing any strata lots, but they may be a spouse of an owner who is attending. Um, by implied consent of attending, their names may be included in the minutes of the meeting. We need to tell the reasons for collection and the disclosure of personal information, um, including to who, whom and how private information is being used. Um, if we are going to be in sharing information such as bank information with a financial institution and the debt loads of the individual with respect to the financial institution, that may be a necessity and that may be implied, but that'll also be part of our privacy policy. Um, we only use, disclose, and retain personal information for the same reasonable purposes for all owners equally. Um, we do, as a corporation, have to ensure completeness and accuracy. We have to respond to privacy complaints without delay. And we have to have very clear and readily available policies for privacy. It, it, it seems like a lot of overkill, um, but surprisingly enough, we've had privacy problems with strata corporations that are only eight or 10 units, all the way up to strata corporations that are seven or, or 800 units. Um, and and the, you know, the protection of the privacy of all owners is absolutely paramount um, when it comes to managing your strata corporation. And then the final thing that a strata corporation must do is erase or make anonymous private information that is no longer required. Um, a strata corporation isn't a data um, policing collection system um, that manages personal information. Um, if it's no longer relevant, it's no longer within the files of the strata corporation. So you as a strata corporation, these are kind of some steps that the um, privacy Co commissioner's office really sets out. Um, but you need to ensure your policies and procedures are being followed. You need to respond to requests by owners and tenants. You need to look at your safeguards for storage and retention. Um, we can set up websites with secure sections where if there is personal information or if there is personal financial information um, with respects to statements, that, that, out, that information has been protected. We need to respond to requests for access of personal information. Um, if an owner comes to you or a tenant comes to you and says, I want a copy of all the information you have on file for myself and my strata lot, the strata corporation has to respond to these requests. 
<clears throat> and then of course, if there's any complaints in relation to its collection use and disclosure, you must disclose those as well. So it's not unusual and almost always by error, but if there's a significant privacy breach within the Strata Corporation's documents, disclosing the fact that there's been a privacy breach to your members and informing the Privacy Commissioner's Office. And you're going to be informing everyone how you've handled and how you've managed it. A, a privacy breach of, of owner personal information could also include financial information and identification. So PIPA requires here, so here's a very clear thing, that you must not collect personal information unless the individual consents. Um, I recently came across a strata corporation that had a form that required owners to fill it out with respect to the collection and payment of strata fees and special levies. It included a requirement for their social insurance number. There is absolutely no reason whatsoever for the strata corporation to collect an owner's social insurance number or credit card information because they are not accepting or using either of those documents. So the, the individuals, of course, objected. Um, the strata had to retract and reissue a new form that only included the bank information that was going to be necessary to process their direct deposits. So it was a form provided by the bank that was then modified um, by the property management company and with the consent of the strata council. Um, only collect the information that's absolutely necessary. Um, there is a there are times where um, you can collect information without consent, um, um, or where the privacy legislation deems that the individual has consented. So collection without consent is is often related to financial information. Um, and a good example of that that frequently gets used is where somebody hasn't paid special levies or strata fees. The bank has used the collection of their information to contact their mortgage provider. They've collected that information without their consent. And in many cases, the mortgage providers will pay for those debts um, and then turn around to collect from their owners or simply add it to their mortgages. So, you know, there are times this occurs or the individual has consented. Individuals who attend council meetings or general meetings um, may be recorded as present for the record. Um, they just simply by appearing, they're deemed to have consented. <clears throat> and once again, you only collect the minimal amount of personal information that's reasonable for your strata corporation to fulfill its obligations under the act and the legislation, nothing more. So we have express consent. Um, this is where an owner consents in writing for the strata corporation to collect their information. And this is usually pre-approved um, pre -approved deposit forms. Um, another form though, is where an owner provides an email address or an alternate address and says, I wish my notices and formal notices be sent to this official address. Um, I may be renting as the landlord or owner. This is my alternate address. So they have given express consent. Implied consent is where individuals voluntarily disclose information. Um, so again, here the example used here is they've given a telephone number to a council um, for the use of emergencies. Um, the other thing is that implied consent can require clarification over the scope and purpose of its use. While we've given the phone number for emergencies, we've not authorized the Strata Corporation to use or distribute that information to other parties. There are some exemptions from consent. And this goes right back to all the records and documents that we're collecting under Section 35 of the Act. Um, when a strata has to collect information, it's required or authorized by law. The Strata Corporation, for example, requires the strata must maintain a list of owners and tenants. It's necessary for to the corporation to collect a debt of the strata corporation. Um, the strata corporation will take reasonable means to be able to collect the debts. Um, it's reasonable to collect that, that, con that collection um, would compromise the availability or accuracy of their personal information and that the collection is reasonable for an investigation or proceeding, which is usually a court action. It's also, if it's clearly in the interest of the individual and consent cannot be obtained in a timely matter, emergency situations, 
strata corporation, there has been a flood or a fire or something. And the strata corporation has had to enter the unit in the process of doing so has collected some personal information. Um, they protect um, that information. It's not disclosed, but they have been aware of it. They have collected it. Um, that there, of course, um, um, would be one of those situations where it's a timely manner. And then, of course, the last item is if it's available from a public source. And public sources have information everywhere, whether it's Facebook or Google or um, LinkedIn or other formats. Um, people put endless amounts of personal information on these sites. Um, use and disclosure is really important, and this becomes a really key part of your policy. Um, personal information that's co collected with consent can only be used and disclosed for the purpose it was originally connected, co um, collected. It can't be used for other purposes, um, and you may have to get new consent for other purposes. So we've collected phone numbers. It was given, it was um, by consent, but now we wish to distribute those phone numbers to everybody else in the building for um, safety, life check-ins and health check-ins and to, to ensure that um, there's communication between owners. We're gonna have to go back to the owners and we're going to get their permission to be able to disclose that information. Um, ex um, the, the Personal Information Act gets a little bit uh, more specific, I think, when we look at um, the exemptions for using and disclosing personal information without consent. They're the same exemptions as for collection. Um, they are set out in two divisions of the Personal Information uh, Protection Act. Um, but again, this really comes down to how the Strata Corporation is managing their personal information. Um, examples of collection without consent. Um, here, here's, a, here's an example. The collection is clearly in the interests of the individual and can't be maintained in a timely manner. And this is the most common is there's a leak in a unit. Um, a neighbor has their information, their personal information, whatever, and they need to be reached in an emergency. Um, uh, personal information is necessary to collect a debt of the Strata Corporation. Um, and so the Strata Corporation issues a demand payment to their mortgage provider. That's more personal information um, that has to be collected. Um, and, and again, it's not information they would have been granted originally, um, but it's information that's going to be necessary for the Strata to proceed with the collection process. And again, here's a, a list of places where you're going to be able to get public sources. Um, BC assessment records are a public source. Um, information at land titles, the, um, the title of the unit itself um, is a public source uh, showing strata lot numbers, unit entitlement voting rates. These are public documents, um, telephone numbers, and of course, all of the other um, types of net social networks that we use. Um, so uh, records that we keep and disclose on request are going to be things like our minutes oftentimes of meetings council members, owners' lists and names, lists of tenants, lists and names of mortgagees, assignments of voting rights, uh, books of account. Um, every time we come to these, these types of documents, they're the most frequent that, that are going to be requested. Um, um, and again, here we are, these are records that we collect um, and, and again, they often time are without consent. Um, but for example, bank statements showing monthly deposits um, may identify um, strata lot numbers in the transactions as to how um, the deposits occur. Those are part of the records of the strata corporation. Those are deposits that are of the strata corporation that are accessible. Waivers and consents um, under the act itself are part of information that we've collected. Form B and Form F information certificates, when requested, when issued, they will include information pertaining to that strata lot. They are collected again and may be um, uh, public. And their information collected, but it's information that is part of the records of the strata corporation. So complaint letters, correspondence sent or received by the strata corporation. This is where we have a lot of disputes. Um, they don't require consent before they're collected, used, or disclosed. Remember, the Act says you must, prior to imposing a fine or a penalty, the strata must issue a notice of complaint. The complaint shows the details, who complained, when they complained, all of those types of things. 
Um, the strata, the, the act requires that the strata corporation to disclose that the owner or assigned tenant um, or the person authorizing writing on their request be a party or be available to reach these this information. However, the Personal Information Protection Act gives us a little bit more flexibility there where there is a risk of threats um, uh, um, or personal risk of safety when matters like this might arise. Um, when you deal with complaint letters, um, this is, and again, this is through PIPA, let owners know through the minutes, their complaint letter, letter must be disclosed upon request. Um, I think it's a way of informing owners that yes, you may complain. Yes, it's a valid complaint, but yes, we must also um, inform the parties who the complaints are. If this goes to a matter of the tribunal, this will the, the evidence will be necessary. Um, you, you may also, as a strata council, accept verbal complaints, provided the council can verify um, that a complaint um, um, is valid. Um, and, and complaints anonymously, anonymous complaints are difficult unless you have evidence. And sometimes it could be a photograph. You know, we have a, a bylaw that says no boats may be parked in any of the townhouse um, uh, park uh, garages. We have a photograph, somebody left their garage door open and there's no car in there, there's a boat in there. Um, so that, that unto itself may be significant evidence. Um, and then of course, you, you have to really, as a strata council, when you're looking at privacy, consider whether it's appropriate to withhold disclosure of the complaint letter. And this often goes to an item um, that may deal with somebody's personal safety. And so you're going to have to, you know, moderate that and look closely at that with respects to, um, uh, at, this, at this point, I would say you're probably going to want to get legal advice on how much do we disclose, um, do we put someone at risk? And usually when the complaints are of this type of nature, they're usually complaints that involve significant information. Um, PIPA requires disclosure to an individual of their personal information under the strata's control. Okay, so including how it's used. So, but it also provides that disclosure is not required if the information was, was collected or disclosed without consent for the purpose of an investigation and the investigation and, and proceedings and appeals have not been re completed. So put that into normal words, we're in the process of looking at a serious bylaw enforcement issue. Um, at this point, we as the Strata Corporation may be going to the tribunal to seek a decision for fines or an order for the party to cease from doing what they are doing. The party doesn't have the right to access um, all of that information until we've completed our investigation and probably filed our claim. And we're probably getting legal advice at this point as we go forward. So it, we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily holding the information in secret, but as the process is being formulated, investigated, um, the Strata Council is going to want to ensure accuracy with respects to the information. They're going to want to ensure that they can verify that what has actually occurred um, is factual so that they can proceed with the claim. Um, the, the Personal Information Protection Act um, really provides your disclosure of this information is not required um, uh, at this point as you're in the process of an investigation. You can't withhold a bylaw complaint letter, um, but it is regional, reasonable to expect that if disclosure would compromise an investigation or proceeding or personal safety, you need to proceed cautiously. Is there a chance of retaliation or that it would silence, silence the complainant? It's a question we often ask when we're going through a bylaw enforcement process. Often time to be bringing a lawyer in to be able to evaluate, are we proceeding this with this correctly? Um, when you, you're required by PIPA to keep the documents um, that you've relied upon for making a decision for one year. Sometimes you might even keep them longer than that because it could be an accommodation issue um, under the Human Rights Code. It could be um, a, uh, an exemption uh, or an accommodation under one of the bylaws um, where the Strata Council has had to make a difficult decision, but the evidence is clear they've made the right decision. They may be wanting to retain that information for a longer time. So what's considered correspondence, letters, emails, any type of memoranda or notes that are shared, 
Texting could be considered to be correspondence, instant messaging, notice of meetings, notice to owners. Um, I kind of live by the rule that if there is anything that you don't want everybody else in the world to know what you've, your opinion is or what you've said, don't put it in a document. Don't put it in a letter. Don't put it in an email. Don't text it. Um, there is always a very good chance that it may come back to haunt you a little bit. Uh, correspondence sent and received by the strata, of course. Um, so here we have the privacy officer. It's correspondence reviewed by the privacy authorized officer that is authorized to be sent on behalf of the council or by the officer who's been delegated the power to deal with the matter. And so this is, um, you've had a request for in personal information. Um, you've had a request for specific documents. This is where the role of your privacy officer comes in. They've been delegated and created the official authority to deal with this. Um, but just remember when we're dealing with things like in-camera meetings, in camera means off the record. We really are not taking minutes. We're not taking notes. We're having a discussion. We may be reviewing some documents or records that have been given to us for a special accommodation or for, for a financial matter, for example. Um, we would retain the minimal amount of records necessary if that was required. But for the most part, um, what we will have from an in-camera meeting is we moved in camera at 8.30, the in-camera session was over at nine o'clock. The decision of the council is as follows. It's the decisions that matter while you're going through this process. Um, other documents that we collect, ballots. We collect general meeting sign-in sheets. We have notices that get posted. Um, proxies, they're technically not the property of the Strata Corporation. However, depending on the purpose of the meeting, Proxies identifying eligible voters may be necessary, and they'd be necessary for the record. And a good example of this is a windup that requires an 80% vote where there may be a number of proxies issued and the credibility of those votes is challenged. Um, those proxies could become a material part of that dispute. So simple guidelines for your minute taking. Um, under And this is again under PIPA. Um, name, strata lot numbers, or unit numbers are okay. Whatever your practice is, don't change. Stick with it. Um, but um, if you want to use names of persons, it doesn't necessarily identify, um, however, the eligible voter. Names at council meetings works just fine. But when you're at general meetings, use strata lot numbers or unit numbers that are consistent, um, easy to identify, <coughs> easy to verify they were at the meeting. The decisions made... <coughs> excuse me, the results of all votes must be recorded. This record, this includes motions that are made at the meeting where there is a seconder and it gets defeated, um, that's fine. And whether the Strata Corporation likes it or not, those are part of the records of the Strata Corporation. Um, discussions need not and should not be included. And the biggest reason for this is there may be accusations that could place your Strata Corporation in jeopardy, misinformation, and at any case, you will never record all of the information fairly. Stick to decisions made. That's what forms part of your records, part of your minutes. And of course, no commentary. That gets strata corporations into deep trouble all the time. Um, and you can include the name of guests who attend meetings. Talked about in, um, in camera stuff. And the final little bit has to do with surveillance. And surveillance is only used um, and here's the example from the Privacy Commissioner's Office. After less privacy intrusive measures have addressed, failed to address the problem. Many of us have fobs in our buildings. We have cameras. Um, the important thing to understand is these can only be about the common property or to protect personal safety concerns. So underground parking garages, common area walkways. We only monitor part, parts of the property required for security. Um, we must have a privacy policy to deal with surveillance and or the use of key fobs. And remember that surveillance policies, they're not really a provision for a strata corporation under the act. Move this into a bylaw to meet all of the terms and conditions for, for, for surveillance. If you have videos, you must prescribe very clearly where they're located, what they're used for, how the information is kept, who has access to them. Um, it's a broad amount of information. Um, again, they're used for limited surface. They are not used for justifying or levying fines. 
Um, and they are certainly not to be used to monitor areas where people are exposed, such as pool areas, fitness rooms, washrooms. Um, hate to say it, but those have come up because strata corporations have actually placed cameras to monitor in those areas. Um, live feed cameras are an invasion of privacy of owners, um, and they and they are not to be made available through your television's cable system um, or to use um, for a routine review of the previous day footage. Um, we're not the strata police. We don't go looking for violators or problems. If there's a complaint, if we've discovered a failure, that's how we managed. Video footage or key fob data can be used um, with respect to evidence of common property, but it's not to be used for the enforcement of minor bylaws. And I think a major bylaw is insurance or damage to property, um, clearly. Um, if you're going to do this, it needs to clearly be identified in your bylaws. And here's a, a, a brief policy summary. Um, it's really um, a, for the for surveillance. And so, so surveillance in key fobs is um, purely for the purpose of collecting personal information. Who is authorized to access these videos is a very key piece of information you need in your policy. The owners need to provide consent they provide consent through a bylaw. The location of surveillance cameras, this also includes signage in those areas that those areas are under um, surveillance. When the cameras are operating, this area is under surveillance and cameras operate 24 hours a day. Length and time the video and key fob records are kept. They will be kept for 30 days and then they will be destroyed. Um, and then of course, if there is an issue, how do we respond to the privacy issues? So create a privacy policy so we know what personal information is, is going to be collected. If you have video um, or surveillance or key fobs, create your po policy and adopt it into a bylaw so you have the consent and the approval of the owners to be able to do this. Um, if you want to use personal information for any purpose that's not set out in your policy, get legal advice. And, you know, many of the law firms have actually set up privacy policies for strata corporations. Reach out to them. Whether you're large or small, they can provide you with a privacy policy. Most small strata corporations really don't have much need for anything extensive. Um, they don't have video cameras. They don't have... Um, other collection devices that they're using, and they're often townhouses with independent addresses. Owners who have door video systems um, or who have surveillance systems only for the purpose of their strata lot. They cannot conduct surveillance of other strata lots or activities of owners moving through the property. Um, I, I always recommend that strata corporation look at the Office of the Privacy Commissioner's website um, and look at updates that occur um, um, on a regular basis. And if you end up with a request for personal information, get legal advice. It, it really will come home for you. It will, it, it's a complicated area that can easily become a serious dispute if you haven't managed it well. And there we go. It's a little bit longer of a session. I think privacy and record keeping need to be divided, Daryl, into two separate sessions. But the problem is they're so intricately related that it's hard to pull them apart. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we do have some questions from earlier on. Um, are homeowners allowed to request the names of the signatories on the Strata bank account? Generally, this is a document given to the bank after the AGM each year. Well, I think that that would be the answer to that would be they should know. And the reason they should know is because the only way those council members are authorized to be signatories is by a decision of council and a decision of council needs to be reported in the minutes. And so um, if they have not done that, then council have not been recording their decisions, which unto itself is a little bit of a problem. But this is not a secret. There's no reason why they should not know. Um, the, you know, my opinion of that is frequently when people are not disclosing that information, they're hiding something. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Um, is it required to keep and share on request uh, a list of tenants or tenanted suites? and a list of approved pets and suites having approved pets. So two separate issues. So the first one is, even though we don't have bylaws that limit or restrict rentals anymore, the Strata Corporation must still retain a list of tenants. We get these through our Form Ks, and if there's any sublets, it comes through a Form K. So yes, they must still retain a list of owners and tenants. 
Some strata corporations request all occupants for emergency and security purposes as well. You know, if you don't know you have five people within, um, um, within your strata corporation, then you you end up having a, a, a bigger problem that occurs. So, um, you know, I think, if, you know, for emergency and security purposes, um, it's really essential. See your videos having trouble again, but um, uh, yeah. the um, alteration requests are two years for retention. What about indemnity agreements that arise if the alteration request is approved? Say that again. And I also didn't answer the pet problem. I was trying to fight with. Oh, yeah, pet. right. Go ahead with the pet one then. Yeah. So if you have approved pets, that's that opens up a kettle of fish. When I see the word approved pets, it implies the strata corporation has a screening or approval process, <coughs> which um, oftentimes those bylaws may not be enforceable to even start with. So I would get legal advice on your bylaw and to whether it is enforceable, is it being applied fairly, what's occurring. Um, but if you have a bylaw that permits pets, um, again, you might be collecting it for personal information, but for the safety of those pets, that would be a really prudent measure to maintain a list of which units have pets in the building. You have to be careful though, if that any of those pets that for some reason are at risk. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Um, and then so back to this one, alteration requests that are, are are retained for two years. What about indemnity agreements that arise if the alteration is approved? So I guess there's a difference here between, you know, what what do we have to retain in the way of correspondence for alteration requests compared to what how long do we retain the actual approvals and indemnity agreements? So alteration requests. Um yeah, I would any alter, alteration requests that including indemnity approvals that have been entered into for a strata lot, I would be retaining retaining them perpetually. I would not be getting rid of them. There could very easily be a matter that arises in the future that's critical for the strata corporation. Yeah, so you know what's been done in the unit, and that's retained until you know it's been changed or removed or whatever. Right? Exactly. Okay, exactly. and that I think that there was another question down. A little further down here, just let me grab it because it was sort of in line with that. Um, so, how do we? Re so, where do we keep that information? So, you now have an alteration request which is kept in the general records of the strata that's re you know retained that way. Uh, these alteration or indemnity agreements uh, are put in to a strata lot file, a separate file that's kept. How do we? How do we manage that information? Uh, you know, the best method of doing that is creating suite files. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know, it really also is the most accessible method for property managers by maintaining suite files for a building. Any any correspondence, alteration agreements, everything collectively gets put into a suite file, whether it's digital, manual, however you do it. It's at your fingertips. It's easier to manage. And when you're doing things like a Form B information certificate, those suite files could be gold for you. So, you know, whether you're, again, whether you're four units, 40 or 400 units, sweet files um, really are a, a key um, document that are necessary for the Strata Corporation. Yeah, and then I, I think there's a question too about, uh, you know, again, along with that, sweet files and things retained by this management firm. Um, what, what does the Strata do when the management firm, when you're changing from one management firm to another and things like building records and plans are not found in the physical records turned over from one manager to another, or even suite uh, information. So that's stuff that you would normally include on the Form B. What do we do about that? So part of the service agreement is contracting for record keeping. Um, if your strata corporation has a transfer to a new management company and transfer of records, then someone probably from your strata council and your new management company needs to go through and audit which records are being transferred, which records are missing, um, and really press for the provision of all of those records. Since we've moved to mostly digital files, it's much easier now to transfer those files and documents. But you know, one of the complaints we've had from management companies is there have been some, you know, difficult companies out there to deal with. 
And rather than put um, all of the records and documents, which are thousands of pages for in most cases for stratas, rather than put them into a logical filing sequence to transfer them over, they just simply cluster bundle and mix them up and put them through a scanner. So it takes forever to pull these things apart and figure out where they actually belong. Um, those are the kind of practices that are really unfortunate and they add a lot of labor and cost for strata corporations. They, the, you know, the simplest solution, get your own website and have all of your records maintained on your website. And then whether it's a new strata council, whether it's a new treasurer, a new privacy officer, new property manager, it doesn't make any difference. The records don't change. You have a consistent long-term living site and create your files in such a way that they are load only. Nobody can go in and remove these records because that's also what occurs and you don't want the inevitable problem to arise from that. Mm -hmm. Any hints on say, for example, the city doesn't have a copy of the plans, the original plans or anything to do with that. Um, mm -hmm. Is there any other hints of where we could go to look for that information if it's not turned over? Uh, for older strata corporations, depending on what regional district you're in or what municipality, they may not exist. You know, we've had we've had total losses of files in some municipalities due to archive floods or fires or, you know, or they just haven't been maintained after 30 years. And, you know, we have strata corporations that are now 60 years old and we have strata corporation buildings that are 90 or 100 years old because they were converted heritage buildings. Uh, so, you know, there are the... The records are not always available. Try to assemble as many of the records as possible. Um, we have a new information bulletin coming out in the spring about the first two, the first year in the life of a strata corporation. That's the time period to access all of your records and documents and make this work. Um, all print, print, at least plans, drawings, and permits at the very least need to be available for everybody. Yeah, and one, one further one here. Um, so how does Estrada deal with former council members keeping owner's ID or owner's information um, themselves? So how does a strata, new strata council, for example, that has a, they know that the former council president has kept a whole bunch of records and is probably going to use them for maybe nefarious purposes. What, what, do we, what can we do about that? Put them under legal notice immediately. Contact okay. the lawyer for the strata corporation. Put these people under legal notice that they are not entitled to have these records and then look at the privacy policy of the corporation see are they breaching anything you might be making a crt application to get an order for compliance with the privacy policy or a complaint to the privacy commissioner's office great i think that's pretty much it anything else we didn't get to we can answer on uh through emails if you like uh, for sure and i think there's a lot of things we didn't get to but that's okay <laughs> it's a it's a pretty daunting subject Oh, I think something just died there, everyone. But again, uh, thank you very much for participating in today's webinar. Uh, Tony has frozen up. So um, we're going to thank you and say goodbye and stay tuned for our next set of webinars if you're signed up for our, our e-update service. Um, if not, uh, please do so and you'll be notified of these kind of events. Thank you very much.